Well, happy Thursday. We are closing out our last topic, believe it or not. It's been fun. So we are getting into ethics and weirdly, I actually have a PowerPoint today. It's not mine. Um, I stole it from Dr. Ellen Mogan, uh, or he, he shared it with me uh, when I first taught this class wow, a couple years ago now. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about ethics, and that'll be our last lab. Uh, I can actually post that today. We'll talk about it briefly. Uh, that'll be our last lab on 416. Um, it goes pretty quick. It's, it's actually a writing lab, which is a little bit of a different change of pace from all the coding we've been doing, but that's it's okay. Um, and then that wraps up the topics. So next week's lecture times. So um, next Tuesday, Thursday in the morning, I'll be here. We can just work around on the final project. If you got questions, I uh, want to work on it. We got the time reserved. The lab should only take you know, 20, 30 minutes worth of time, and then the rest again we can use on the final project. So hopefully, we can get those close to done by next week. So you don't have too much to worry about during final project presentations, which is in is that two weeks? No, the 23rd. That's a week from Tuesday, right? So a week from Tuesday, eight in the morning. We got presentations for the final project. So. Uh, that'll wrap things up for us. Um, yeah, I went through, I got the first project scored. I think I got most of the quizzes in. I think I got one more to go. Um, if you didn't put in a self-assessment, I just left a note, left a comment. Hopefully you saw it in Canvas. Um, I'd like you to do your self-assessment before I go and score it. Um, so and then for the first one, I'll, look, I'll take a look at the second one and, and do the same. Uh, but should have most of those in by... Uh, end of Friday, um, so that next week we can you'll pretty much know where you are. Uh, sort of the goal with that. All right. Uh, so for ethics, uh, this is actually really weird. I I never liked being read to when I was a student, so I, I got a real strong distaste for PowerPoint because people would stand up there and read what was on the screen, and that's no fun because like if it's on the screen, you can read it, and, and most people can read faster than people can talk. So. Um, Again, I try not to use PowerPoint because I just didn't like that. But might might have taken it a little too far because you know you can use it well, but you don't actually read to people and you just use it to like keep your your main ideas here. So um, again, I'll I'll do do my best not to read things to you um, as we go with this. Um, but we'll talk about engineering as a profession. We'll talk about a specific code of ethics and then a couple case studies. Just some quick little discussion um, goes pretty well. Um, but what's interesting is that specifically we break things out into professions, things that you're a professional at, and engineering is one of those things. Um, so engineering specifically is rather broad. You can engineer all sorts of things here. It's not just software engineering. Um, but this is using your knowledge of math and science gained by study, experience, and practice. And those three pieces are really important here. So you've studied you have some experience and you've, you're practicing and you apply it with judgment. So it's, you use your professional judgment when you work these things, when you practice, to develop ways to utilize economically the materials and forces of nature for the benefit of mankind. This is kind of a lofty goal when we want to define what is engineering. And this comes from our accrediting body here, uh, which is cool. So our degrees are accredited by the ABET organization. Um, I'm sure you picked your school because you knew we had an accredited degree, but um, we go through a, a lot of steps to make sure our, pro our program is accredited. So um, being a profession is, is actually, it it's sets us apart, right? You, you hear other careers or other professions generally, like lawyers and doctors are, are pretty common ones. Now, if you ever go to the doctor, they, they're, they're practicing on you, right? They, they call it their practice. They practice medicine. I always thought that was a kind of a weird term here, uh, but that's the idea. They're applying what they've done with judgment. That's their practice here. Um, so one of the things when we do our accreditation, ABIT looks at um, this item F here is the one we're starting to bring into the conversation, ethics. Right? What does it mean to be professional and have ethical responsibilities? So we'll start the conversation. You'll do it in other of your classes as well. I promise this, old, this isn't the only treatment of it, uh, but it's good to start thinking about it early. So to be professional, you have to have some study, you have to have experience, you have to have some practice that you're doing. 
and there's some level of education that you need, depending on which area you go to, right? For lawyers, you need a Juris Doctorate degree. That's their standard of education here. For doctors, you need medical school, right? those sorts of things. Um, and then, again, we're being a little bit lofty and, and aspirational here, but you use your professional skills to serve humanity, right? This, this idea to benefit mankind here, right? Which I, I think is good. I, th I think it's good that we're setting the bar there. Um, so engineering specifically as a profession, right, there's a lot of need for it. Right? You need engineers to design and build all sorts of cool things. Um, there's discretion and judgment that is hard to standardize. There's a lot of things we can build some standards around, but you can't just have, hey, here's the standard thing. Right? You need someone to, who has the knowledge, who has done the study and has practiced to go in and apply their profession with their professional judgment. Um, now, a lot of people get into software, or really any engineering field, but software particularly, because you have knowledge and skills not commonly possessed by the general public, and that means, thanks to economics and supply and demand, you, we can make a lot of money in software. Because there's not as many people who can do it, there's a lot of demand for software. Right? Turns out, literally every industry in the world uses software now, even farming. Everyone uses software to do something in their industry nowadays, which is kind of crazy to think about that it didn't exist generations ago, not too long ago, right? So there's been this huge growth in the application of software to literally every industry in the world. Um, that's been cool. So if you have the knowledge and skills that n not other people do, you can make money doing it, sort of how that works. Uh, there's a group consciousness that promotes knowledge, professional ideas, and social services. So there's a couple organizations. So we'll talk about IEEE and ACM. They're, they're pretty two old, older, well-known organizations um, that run journals to promote knowledge. Right? You can submit papers and things um, to them. They, they put out things, professional ideas. They have cool social services and things they promote, which is fun. Um, not as much in software, uh, but in engineering, certain fields of engineering, and I only know this vaguely here, there's certain legal status you have. So if you're the chief engineer on a bridge building project and the bridge fails, if it failed because you knowingly cut corners and did things that were against best practice, you are personally liable. You have a legal liability for your project. Now, it's a little harder to do with software and we haven't really gone down that road. Um, I'm curious how this will work when we get to more automation in the world, but you know, that, that's something to get to later. Um, then as a profession, there's some standards of admission to be considered, hey, this is a, the profession here. Um, for engineers, usually that's a bachelor's degree here, uh, depending on what field you're in. And then a code of ethics that allows the professional body as an organization to say, this is our code of ethics, this is the things we think we should do and why it's important. So why is it important to have a code of ethics? Why is it important to adhere to some principles? Well, um, interestingly, like attorneys, lawyers, and doctors, they, they deal with their clients directly all the time. If we write an app on our phone that's accessible to a billion people in the world with a click of a button, we're not talking to any of them. I mean, like 0.000001% or something like that of the, the billions of people who can use your app, you might talk to. But you're not dealing directly with those who benefit from the things you've done. Now, if you work in an organization that does small internal apps and you, you actually work directly with your end users, yeah, you might. Depends on the scale of what you're working on here. Um, but we often don't do that. And then the larger engineering profession who design and build things, right? The, your bridge builders, your, your civil engineers, the mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, they don't deal with those people. Like you don't talk to the engineer who built the bridge. You don't put their name on it anywhere. Um, someone had a joke one time that we should put the paving company's names down on all the roads so that when they start getting more potholes again, we know whose fault it was. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, and again, depending on what your level of etiquette is. So when we, when we think about ethics and we think about how we interact with people, um, there's a, a couple levels of interaction, right? There's, there's etiquette, there's law, there's morals, and there's ethics. So for our etiquette, that's just, this is what you usually do. This is what we expect. You don't have to do it. And if you don't follow proper etiquette, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, but people are going to think you're a little weird. 
And that's okay. Um, when it comes to laws, if you don't follow the laws, there's consequences, right? Um, so we can make laws that require you to do things and you get a consequence for not doing them. And we make laws that say you can't do these things and if you do them, you can get a consequence. Right? You get kind of one or the other when it, when it comes to our, our legal systems here. Um, for morals, that tends to be very personal. Your personal beliefs of right and wrong and you develop those from your upbringing, religious beliefs, societal influences, whatever, helps develop your individual moral code. But then ethics helps codify moral behavior. So it's, it's more a, um, a little bit broader here than an individual, right? It's the code defining it. And interestingly, um, we run into situations where the law, what is legal or illegal to do, and morality, what we think is the right and wrong thing to do, they're in conflict. Um, a lot of times, the legal system doesn't have a law about situations. It'd be really hard to write a law for every single possible situation out there in the world. And, and no one wants to have, you know, libraries full of law books. I, mean, I guess the lawyers do um, because they make a lot of money off of it. But um, we just can't do that, right? Encoding some moral standards into laws is unenforceable. Right? Depending on what your, your moral beliefs are and things, you just can't enforce them with law. There's just no way to do that. Um, laws have to be impartial and treat everyone the same. Laws can only observe governable behavior. The things that we can see are observable behavior. You, you can't enforce laws based on what people think. There's a whole movie about that um, and, and things like that. And then you might have laws enacted by places like North Korea and Russia that can codify immoral things into law. Um, so just because there's a law for it doesn't actually mean that it's moral. So, um, and, and you know, I, sh I should make fun of America too. We, we have our own sets of issues, but um, generally I like to point the finger at, at communist countries and things. And, uh, all right, um, so some examples. If there's a new industrial waste byproduct that you know is environmentally harmful, but it's new, so there's no law against dumping it. It's legal. But we would probably easily say this is immoral to start dumping this industrial byproduct. Right? I think that, that one's pretty easy. Um, number two is a little bit, a little bit more gray. Um, so if you work for the government, you have to follow a given purchasing process, which means you have to get the purchasing agent to go and buy things for you. You can't just go buy them yourself because of reasons. I don't, sure, whatever it is. But you need some sort of something for whatever experiment you're working on. You just want to go get it from the junkyard and then expense it from the office supplies fund. Is that illegal? I don't know, is, is there a law around that you have to follow your company process? Probably not. I mean, you're not like stealing money from them. You, you, know, you did spend the money, I don't know. That one's, you know, but is it the right thing to do? Probably not. Like you're supposed to follow these processes. But it gets to be more interesting if you start looking at other factors. Like, well, what, what does the delay of having to go through the purchasing agent mean? What if the purchasing agent has to buy it from someone who sells new parts instead of a junkyard who gives me a used part? And now we've spent five times as much money on this thing. Is that right? Is that wrong? So we, we start to introduce a lot of gray moral area. When we start talking about moral issues, most of it's gray. Right? Very rarely is it easily, yes, this is, we, we, everybody knows this is right and wrong. Everybody knows this is bad. Right? Most of the time we deal with these gray middle areas. Um, and then another one, in some moral codes, um, thinking thoughts, we would, might consider to be equivalent of performing the act. But we can't write laws about thoughts. It, just, it doesn't work like that, right? Um, so when it comes to professional ethics, right, ethics is that study of morality of human actions. So our professional ethics help us guide the ethical behavior of the profession. So most of our societies, technical societies, have these things here. So we're going to take a look at, jump out of here for a second, our software engineering code of ethics. Code of ethics. And there's one here. Um, from IEEE ACM, so a joint task force. Um, I went together and put together this code of ethics. Um, is it that one? I think it's this one. So you get principles and then you get supporting um, 
pieces of it, supporting canons of those principles. So the like the high level here of the eight principles of the Code of Ethics for Software Engineers that were put together uh, that we ask professionals to ascribe to. Um, your duty and responsibility, ethical responsibility to the public. So it says software engineers should act consistently with the public interest. This is really broad, and there's a lot of things we can dig into as we get there. Um, but I, I appreciate that we're trying to put you know, back to that lofty definition of what is it to be an engineer. Right? We're serving the public interest for bettering humanity. Right? Um, if client and the employer, you should act in a manner that is in the best interest of your client and employer with the public interest. So someone pays you to do something, and you're doing work for someone else. Sometimes it's the same company doesn't always have to be. So again, um, if it's different, cool. If it's not, your internal company is still your client, that's okay too. Um, but acting in the best interest of them, consistent with the public interest. Now, um, when we used to go out and do career fairs when I worked at the healthcare company, one of the things that we liked to pitch people in, in an attempt to sway people to not go work for Amazon or not go work for uh, Facebook and, and places. We said, you know, you could go and make money selling ads. Like that's, that's really the only stuff Facebook makes money on is ads, right? Uh, or you could work in healthcare and actually like help people have better lives and help improve healthcare outcomes. That works for some people. There's, there's a draw for some people to say, hey, the work that I do will help people rather than the work that I do makes more money for my company. And again, I'm, that's okay. Like, Facebook does good things for lots of people, helps people be connected. It's not, it's not, all, not all bad just because the goal of them is to make money. Um, but it's interesting to think about hey, how do we balance those sort of things. So there's nothing wrong with making your employer money. Now, I might argue at some point some of the apps and games that we have on our phone that use known um, addicting triggers and things to get you to come back to the app and get you to, hey, here's another microtransaction, here's another microtransaction, you can pay 99 cents for five more lives, you can try try again, and, you know, keep your streak alive if you log into the app, you know, three times a day, you know, seven days a week, you get more prizes and things. If you start to incorporate those psychological triggers and things, I don't think that's in the best interest of the public to write apps that waste people's times, like knowingly hooking them into using your app. I feel like that's beyond a gray area. But again, this is my, my thoughts on this here. Um, it's in your employer's interest, for sure, to make them lots of money. Is it your client's interest to get them addicted to your app? Make them spend as much money as you can? No. I mean, no. There's nothing wrong with apps for fun. There's nothing wrong with people spending money on entertainment and leisure. But if you knowingly go after those addictive behaviors and try and, and, and trick people into those sorts of things that we know they're vulnerable to, I think we've probably gone too far. And that makes for an interesting case study. There's a whole, um, was it apps with, oh man, Black, what do they call Black they call it? No, um, ding. Oh, Someone had a list of apps. Um, no addicting psychological features. What was it here? This was a, an article. Someone had a, a whole ranking. I, I've got the link. I forgot where I put it here. Um, but these sorts of things. So if you, if you do the right searching, we can find stuff here. Um, decoding addictive apps. There we go. Yep. And then, look, psychology, we can go find a therapist. <laughs> Sometimes the search isn't great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we only got through two, sorry. Um, the product. You shall ensure their product related and related modifications meet the highest professional standards possible. I love this one, and I like to harp on it when we talk about testing. I, I think I probably spend way too much time talking about testing and how important I think it is. And unit test is just one piece of testing. There's lots of ways to do testing, but uh, I, I think that's a very easy minimum to hit okay, to ensure that it's doing what we expect it to do. Now, the highest professional standards possible. We've tested every single bit of code everywhere. That's probably the highest standard, right? But when, you know, when it comes down to the real world, we have limited resources. We don't have unlimited money to spend on products, projects, and products and things that we write. 
So with a limited budget, we'll test as much as we can. And we'll probably feel okay about that, right? Um, it's not a life or death thing for most of the apps that we write. Um, now, for someone who's developing software for my insulin pump, I really, really, really hope that they're like, oh, we got to 75% code coverage, that's good enough. That would not make me feel good about having this in my pocket. Because uh, if this thing malfunctions, it will literally kill me. Um, so, you know, depending on what the use of your product is, the level of testing is probably going to be a little bit different. Um, all right, and judgment. You should have integrity and independence in your professional judgment. This one's cool. So when we, when we talk about um, our case studies later on, what we're going to do in lab, um, this is a big one here. And having this as the a piece of our ethical, our, our code of ethics lets us say, hey, here's my, my professional judgment on this. I can maintain some integrity um, and have independence in my judgment. Just because you're paying me and telling me to do this doesn't mean this is the right thing to do. Right? Um, management, I'm, I'm fond of this, that we have this as its own category here. Software engineering managers and leaders shall subscribe to and promote an ethical approach to management of software development and maintenance. An ethical approach in treating people well is important. Um, you don't want to get in, in the news for being a terrible game company that makes your, all, your entire dev team work mandatory overtime to ship a game by an arbitrary deadline. That sort of nonsense happens, and I just don't understand why. Like, deadlines are useful, right? And um, if you're like me, when you don't usually do things until they're due, because they're not due yet, then you don't have to do it yet. So having a due date helps people get things done psychologically, um, but making people sacrifice evenings and weekends and time with their family and work 80-hour work weeks to hit an arbitrary deadline is, is, is rather cruel. Um, I'd imagine here. So um, other cool things and supporting people with management in our code of ethics is cool. Um, profession. Software engineers shall advance the integrity and reputation of the profession consistent with the public interests. I love this one too. Um, it always irritates me when people write malware and do bad things and infect people's computers with viruses and um, our, our black hat hacker folks are not professionals and they make everyone else look bad and I hate it. Um, we don't do things like that because it doesn't advance the integrity and reputation of the profession consistent with the public interest. Right? I think that one's pretty easy. Um, your colleagues, you should be fair and supportive of your colleagues. And there's, again, more supporting ideas here. And then self, you should participate in lifelong learning regarding the practice of your profession and should promote an ethical approach to the practice of the profession. Um, the great thing about software is it's always changing. You're always going to be learning something here. Um, it will not be boring. I mean, there are, there are projects and things that you do that you will work on that are boring, but as an industry as a whole, there's always new stuff, always interesting things, um, new things to learn, um, and that's one of the reasons I like it, which is really cool. Um, so each of those then has its own set of supporting canons and things. Um, so, like, be encouraged to volunteer professional skills to good causes, contribute to public education concerning the discipline. And so they, they kind of further detail some of these things. So that's the code of ethics. So you have the principles and the canons that expand upon those rules. Um, all right, we went through those ones. So when you get to conflicts, and we have to look at, well, what is the right thing and what is the wrong thing? If it's just a factual issue, it's very easy because we have just facts to compare. So it's not abstract. When we start looking at the application, it's a little bit more abstract. Conceptual and then moral issues tend to be the most abstract. So um, just a, a moral thing, to, a moral conflict. Should drivers be allowed to speed? We have the technology. Your, your car knows what the speed limit is on basically every road you're ever on with your, thanks to your GPS and your phone. And we can make cars not speed. You know, trucks have been doing it with governors forever. Not ever, but very long time. We could make it, we could engineer and design vehicles to not be allowed to speed, right? Should we? You know, are there, are there times when people should be allowed to speed and break the law? It's technically illegal. Although, that's another fun debate you can debate with the philosophy folks here. Um, if the only consequence of breaking a law is a monetary fine, is it really illegal, or is it only illegal for poor people at that point? 
That, that's a fun debate to have with people. Um, so, I mean, should we let people speed? We know the majority of accidents happen when people are speeding. It'd be safer not to. Oh, well, what if, like, I have to drive my kid to the hospital and I want to speed on the road to get there faster, right? That could have negative consequences as well. So, interesting. Um, what about just a little bit more conceptual? So, speeding technically is driving above the speed limit, 70 miles an hour or so, or with adverse driving conditions, driving at a speed that will cause an accident. That's a little bit harder, right? It was raining this morning. Not everyone was driving very fast on the freeway. Kind of slow. And there was actually two people, two cars I saw in the middle of the, the ditch, the median. Probably they were driving too fast in the rain and slid off. Um, specific application. Is it speeding if you're going 55 miles an hour and skidded off the road? I mean, if it causes an accident, yes. This is, this is a pretty easy application here. You're going less than the speed limit, but you're going at a speed with adverse conditions that cause an accident. Or just a fact, which is calibrated better, the police radar gun or my speedometer of my car? We can measure those things and find out, right? So as you, you work your way to less and less and less abstract, it's generally much easier to make decisions on things. Um, but these high-level moral quandaries tend to have all sorts of gray area, right? Um, so other types of ethical issues, conflict of interest, whistleblowing, safety, environmental safety, product liability, public service, don't bother with the YouTube video right now. Um, for conflicts of interest, you shouldn't be involved in decisions that will affect you monetarily, or maybe even other things like that. Uh, we don't do a good job of this with our government employees, which is a bit of a bummer, uh, but you know, that's okay. Congress is this whole other issue. Um, but I can't tell U of M to go and buy software from a company that I own, or that I have an, an interest in. That would make me money, right? That would be a conflict of interest. Hey, let's go spend our research money on this, on this software here that I happen to make a lot of money every time we sell probably pretty easy to say that's a, a conflict of interest, right? It, it's harder to be objective. Not impossible, but harder to be objective on things when they impact you monetarily. People tend to be bad at that. Uh, for whistleblowing, for reporting issues, you can be a whistleblower, um, report issues for things. So I think this happened with Boeing recently. Uh, and it was a very interesting engineering whistleblower case there with the production of one of their jets. So issues here. Um, Technically, they can't fire you for being a whistleblower, but I, the whole thing is just a little bit weird, but anyway, uh, those sorts of things. And then the SEC actually has a really cool whistleblower program. SEC whistleblower, largest award. So with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission gives a portion, percentage based of how much money is recovered based on reporting fraudulent activities to whoever reported that and said, hey, the company I'm working for is doing illegal things, right? So the largest award is $279 million that somebody was awarded for reporting their company for fraud, being a whistleblower, saying, hey, we've done illegal things. Um, let's see. Yeah, $279 million. Who was it? Did it say who it was for? Four billion dollars in fraudulent, ill-gotten gains and interest. Whew. Oh, it doesn't say who it was. So ten to thirty percent when they recover when they recover more than a million dollars. So they're incentivizing this sort of activity, which I think is a good thing, right? Uh, if there's no reason to do it, it's a little bit harder for some people to go and, and step up and do that, especially if. Your company's been doing illegal things and gets fined a billion, four billion dollars. Your company might go out of business. You might lose your job. You're not going to get fired for it, but just the company just won't exist anymore, right? So, like, getting a little bit of money back in your pocket for that might be a good thing. Here, um, all right, and limited funds and resources. This is sadly a, a reality in the world. We don't have unlimited time. We don't have unlimited money. We don't have unlimited anything. To work on our projects. So how do we make decisions that affect the health and safety and welfare of the public or things that might detrimentally affect parts of the population here based on the decisions that we make, right? Um, that gets to be tricky. So thinking about software specific things. What if we write software that only runs on certain platforms? 
Is that an ethical issue? If you're at an app that only runs on Android or an app that only runs on iOS or something that only runs on Windows or something that only runs on Linux? It's generally pretty easy to say no because people could go and get those devices right, if they really wanted our app. But you know, depending on what that software is, would it be fair if the government offered some sort of, hey, here's your free tax filing, but you only do it on Android? That's probably pretty easy to say no, that, that would not be a very good thing to do, right? Um, what about software that uses lots of bandwidth? Netflix, Prime Video, you know, any of our streaming services. Right? The internet bandwidth that we have is limited, and our software just uses all of it. Is that wrong? I mean, we're not really wrong, but we could do better, maybe? Those sorts of things. So th those get to be interesting. The bandwidth is a limited resource. Um, what about writing programs that don't secure data? This one's pretty easy. There's lots of ways to secure data and not lose information. Um, I don't know how often you, you folks get letters about information that was lost and things. Um, turns out there's uh, the High Tech Act from years ago now has uh, the wall of shame, which is, I don't think actually does as much as it could, but um, if healthcare companies lose people's information. They get posted on the wall of shame here. Now, you might not want to do business with them, but sometimes in an emergency, the hospital down the street is the hospital down the street and you're gonna go there anyway, right? Uh, so it gets to be a little bit tricky, but uh, in general, right, you can go and see. So let's see if we can find some Michigan companies here. I think it was page four. Is it four? I looked at this uh, on Tuesday with my other class. Yeah, here we go. Um, uh, Trinity Health lost the records of 5,738 people due to unauthorized access and disclosure on a network server. Lots of these are hacking or IT incidents, but, but other things happen here too. Uh, let's go to the next page here, see if we see any other Michigan companies. Here's a couple more. Uh, University of Michigan. Hey, that one sounds familiar. Lost the records of 61,000 people due to a hacking and IT incident. Hey, oh, this wasn't even uh, the start of the semester. This was after the start of the semester when they didn't have the network running in the fall. Remember that we tried to start the fall semester and they said, oh, no internet for you. <laughs> and they wouldn't tell anybody about it. And it turns out they got hacked. Okay, uh, they, they're on the wall of shame now. But, so these sorts of things, they have to be reported. Is there any more info? There's not much more info on it. Um, but it's interesting, right? This is 877,000 records from Wright and Philippus due to a hacking incident here. Someone emailed, Trinity Health emailed information out over email 45,000. So not securing your data makes it vulnerable to these things. Now, Security is hard. Go talk to any of the, the cybersecurity profs here. Um, and turns out the human factor tends to be the hardest thing of that. Because if I have access to the records to do the things I need to do, and I get compromised, they can use my access. Right. So it's not just, hey, we're going to store it right. But even though it's stored securely, people still have to access that and get that information out. So all sorts of issues here. Security is tough. And I don't mean to make fun of anybody because security is hard. But... Um, Securing our data is very important, very important. All right. Um, so what about if we were designing guardrail or deciding where we should put guardrails? They cost money. Should we put them on a two-lane scenic mountain road with very steep shoulders, and if a car falls off, you're basically dead, but only 20 cars a day travel on the road? Or should we put them on a four-lane highway where if you fall off, there's only about 10% chance of dying here, but 22,000 cars a day travel this road. Well, what do we do? Well, this one, you know, it's actually, we can get down pretty easily to a factual math issue here. What has more accidents? What will save more lives? Right? Just do the arithmetic and figure out where's a better place to spend the money on this. Uh, so that can work, right? If we only have enough money to do certain things. Uh, this one was not as interesting, code of ethics. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, we can skip that one too. All right. So we should, as a profession, as a professional working in the profession, behave in an ethical manner. You can't make people behave ethically. Right? 
you can have laws and enforce our laws that codify some things, right? But the idea is that we want to encourage people and promote an ethical approach to our profession. Um, there are conflicts. You can apply different moral theories. Resource allocations is tough here. So um, what we're going to do is identify issues, moral issues, conceptual issues, application issues, factual issues, um, and work on that. So let me grab our lab exercise here. Um, and I'll post, I'll post it now for anyone who wants to work ahead on that. That'll be our last lab here. So this is lab 11, ethics. So technically, stop that. Stop. There we go. Uh, we can do on the 22nd. No, no, 23rd. Um, ideally, it's done before the final project presentations. But, you know, if you need a few more minutes, that's fine. Not super concerned uh, with that one here. I just got to do a quick copy paste. Apologies. Nope. This button here. There we go. All right. So using our code of ethics here, we're going to write a paragraph about how we would decide to program a self-driving car based on this moral machine. So I'll show you that in a second for part one. Then part two, we're going to read this New York Times article about Uber. I'll talk about this in a minute. Write a paragraph based on the code of ethics about how we respond to being assigned to the project by management while it's being used to evade U.S. law enforcement. You want to be specific in your parts of the code of ethics, cite specific parts of the code of ethics in your response. So this one is just text entry. Weird. We have no code for this one. So the moral machine is this fun little, it's going to set up scenarios for us. What do we think a self-driving car should do? Because somebody has to code it, right? And we're assuming that we know what happens. Again, this, the, you know, there's, lots, there's going to be lots of gray area. Do you know for sure it will kill the passenger? Do you know for sure it will kill pedestrians? It's generally pretty easy to know. If you hit a pedestrian going fast enough, their chance of survival is pretty low. Right? We, we know that one. Um, chance of surviving in an accident of like driving no barricade? It depends on the car. But again, so we're, we're making some assumptions. So should the car just run right into the barricade because the brakes failed? Or should the car swerve and kill the pedestrians? Which, by the way, one of them is a criminal. We can tell that, obviously, because you can tell criminals. Uh, this one seems a little silly. Uh, what should we do? This will kill three people. This will kill one person. And you get to pick. So you make judgments here and decide. Um, you can kill animals. You can kill people. Hey, they're jaywalking. We should kill them because they shouldn't be in the road. It's their own fault here. Or, you know, um, these people are athletes versus fat people. Well, what should we do? Um, I'm going to go through and pick a couple of these. And we'll look at what it gives you at the end. This car is empty. Should we run over four people or three people? Right? Weird that it's empty. Should we run over old people or young people? And some of the choices here. Should we run over a cat or swerve to not hit the cat? All right, one last one here. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, no, that's not right. No. Okay, here's the result. So then it gives you hey, some different ranges here. So does saving more lives matter or not matter? So is it important to prioritize what kills the least amount of people? So for us, we landed right in the middle, apparently. For others, a lot of other people who do this exercise, they matters more. Protecting passengers, does it matter more to us or not matter to us? Is it... Which should we prioritize? Does it matter if people are jaywalking or not? Is it okay to kill them because they were jaywalking? And should we avoid hitting people who are crossing legally? Should we avoid intervention? So this is the big one for me, and I think this is probably the easiest approach to take, is that if we don't make the car do anything, the brakes fail, the brakes fail, it just keeps going. That's easy, right? Um, again, that, that's one approach here, because if you make it to do something, then at that point, we're putting the decision in our hands in our code. That we've written code to have special handling. Hey, if the brakes fail, now we have to make decisions rather than, hey, the brakes fail? Well, the brakes fail, whatever, right? There's no, nothing else we're gonna do about it. Um, you can have gender preferences possibly. You can have species preferences. Apparently we prefer the humans here. Age preference, we should kill the old people versus the young people if we can tell. Fitness preference or social value preference, if you have a doctor versus a criminal, um, doesn't matter which one we run over. Um, so they give you some different scenarios. So the idea is just go through a couple of them and then talk about, just in a paragraph, doesn't have to be an entire essay, just a paragraph, how you would program a self-driving car based on the code of ethics and cite a particular piece of the ethics here. Like what, what should we prioritize when we're writing our software here?
And it doesn't even have to be realistic. Like you can pretend that we'll know everything. That's okay. Um, our, our cameras in cars are not going to be perfect yet. But if they were, right, um, go for it. And the next one then is this New York Times article, which you probably have to be on the U of M network because we get free New York Times articles here or log in with your free subscription. You can get a free subscription through the library because libraries are awesome here. Uh, so Uber, years ago, this is old now, um, had this project or tool called Grayball. And Grayball um, started, I believe, in Europe where the taxi cab unions in Europe would call Uber cars and then they would take the driver out and beat them for not driving with the taxi cab union and driving for Uber, which is a, a pretty bad thing, right? Um, so this was designed as a safety tool for drivers in Europe, right? Keep them safe by not letting you go pick someone up who's going to hurt you. I think that's pretty good, right? Um, but turns out as they started rolling out Uber in America, in in the U.S. here, and some cities said, hey, we don't like this because you're not a licensed taxi service. Again, this is a couple years ago. Um, this wasn't as, as popular then. Um, we're going to give tickets to your drivers. Someone at Uber decided, oh, hey, you know that gray ball thing that we have? We can use that so that our drivers don't go pick up cops who give them tickets. And someone said, hey, this is a good idea. We can avoid law enforcement by using gray ball. And one of the things here, which is a little bit silly, but that's okay, said, hey, if the person hailing a ride, if their credit card that they added is from a police credit union, don't go pick them up. And with lots of other features and things here, but that was one of the tools they used I thought was kind of funny here. Uh, so if you were a cop using your credit card from your, your police credit union, you probably weren't gonna get a ride on Uber, even if you weren't there to give someone a ticket. Um, but these sorts of things. So read the article and then come up with a paragraph um, based on, hey, management told you you're working on the Grayball project. Now, what would you say? What would your response be? And cite some of the specific code of ethics in your response here, right? I mean, I think it started as a great, great idea. We want to protect our drivers, but using it now to evade, evade law enforcement and, and do these things is its own issue. Um, and you don't even have to, if you want to get into the ethics of whether or not we think the gig economy jobs are good for people or not, um, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, do you think it's good? As they, they all like to argue, oh, it's good for people because they can get work at their own schedule when they want it. And rarely like, oh, hey, we're going to take people's labor and pay them crappy rates here because they're signing up for it themselves um, and not give them benefits and not give them insurance and they have to deal with their own car issues and, and things like that. So there's, there's the whole other ethical issue too of, of the gig economy and, and Uber kind of jobs. So um, you can get into that if you want, but this, you know, ideally we're focused more on the software side of things, but, you know, writing the Uber software enables that sort of stuff too. So, um, all right. It's kind of depressing today, talking about ethics, I apologize. <laughs> um, but teaching people, talking about it, keeping it focused, um, and that promoting an ethical approach to software does help the world. There's lots of cool things we can do with software that have helped the world. Um, we can keep doing that. Um, so, all right, got any questions, thoughts, concerns? If not, I think we're good. I will see you folks on Tuesday then, if you want to come for working on the project. If you don't want to come, that's okay. I'll hang out so I can answer questions. Lab time, we'll work in the ethics lab. We'll have more time to work on the project Thursday as well. And then we have presentations a week from Tuesday. Thanks so much.